on the tightrope of talent, balance meets brilliance. Today we are graced by a presence of a man whose life story reads like a manual of mastering multiple crafts. He isn't just any mentor, he is my greatest mentor. A man who under the glaring lights of the fight game helped sculpt a handful of professional fighters, myself included, in having skill and confidence when making the walk to combat. Yet the ring wasn't his only battlefield. From the busy streets of Los Altos, California, he established and spearheaded his business, Soto Creative, a marketing behemoth that over two decades has been the backbone of countless brands and companies, transforming visions into visuals, ideas into identities, and investments into impressive ROIs. But beyond the bright lights of the business world and the roaring crowds of the fight game, he's been a champion in the most demanding roles of all, a loving husband and a dedicated father. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor of mine to present to you with one of the greatest men I have ever come across, if not the greatest man I've ever known. I give you Rick Soto. I think the last time I saw you was at, um, I think, Chris's or Katrina's fight when mm -hmm. they were going to fight on the amateur card. That was mm -hmm. like the last mm -hmm. time I saw you. Yeah. But I've known you since my amateur days, mm. right? Okay. But being affiliated with you was, I would say, I've only worked with you my last fight, which is mm -hmm. pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, ever, did you ever think that we would ever work together? No. Every time we bumped into each other? No. Why not? Um, I didn't want to take any more fighters on. Yeah. So when you called me up, I was in Carmel. And uh, I got a text message from you. I'm like, what the heck? So I contacted Anthony. I said, Anthony, did you give <laughs> Daniel Gonzalez my, my phone number? Anthony lied. He goes, mm, I don't think so. I said, what do you mean you don't think so? I said, I, I can't take on another fighter. I don't want to take on any more fighters. Yeah. I don't want you guys to fight to begin with. Yeah. So then I spoke to you. and I said, oh, okay. That was like an interview. Yeah. For the craziest job ever. <laughs> <laughs> for me or for you? For me. Oh. It, felt, it felt very intimidating because I've never had somebody sit me down, ask me, say, tough questions, and also have an envelope and writing things down as I'm talking. I'm like, what is he writing down? Is it good or bad? I'm not used to that. And I think a lot of people aren't used to that as we were talking off air. Yeah. Um, you definitely <clears throat> coach very differently. You definitely lead and guide very differently. Uh, where did that come from? Like... Did you, did you have a mentor that kind of passed that on to you? Did you read a no. certain book or certain mentors? No, I had no mentors at all. But where it came from is uh, strictly from business. Mm -hmm. Business of hard, hard knocks. Business of watching other successful organizations and people uh, go about the way they handle business. And in my business, which was advertising and marketing design uh, or branding, uh, we had to be very strategic. I, let me back up. You didn't have to be very strategic, but it was smart to be very strategic, to know who your target audience is, um, their uh, ideologies, their demographics, the psychographics, and so forth. So when we presented a campaign, I knew exactly who it is that we're talking to mm. and what are their key points. And the same thing can translate over to fight business. Mm. So when I was asked by Alex at uh, AKA Sunnyville to to start coaching um, John and Anthony and Liam, um, I said, oh, God, I don't know anything about MMA. I don't even like MMA. When I, at that point in time, was it 12, 14, 15 years ago, when I would see an MMA fight, I would be bored <laughs> to tears because it was like a um, fighting roosters. Mm -hmm. They're very linear. They'd jump up. They'd scrap. Uh, sometimes they may have had some blaze on the back of their <laughs> claws and so forth, but nonetheless, it was not very exciting for me. Mm. So when I had to begin to work with these guys, I thought, okay, what is it that I need to know? So I did my research, okay, aside from the cockfighting and so forth, what do we need to do to win, mm. okay? Because <clears throat> I like winning. I make no bones about that. I'm very competitive. So with business, how I translate the business is that, okay, to me, this is very similar to a business, and that is to know who your target audience is, know 
your enemy, I shouldn't say enemy, your competitor, mm -hmm. and uh, what is their strengths, their, what is their weaknesses, what are their threats, and so forth. So I diagnosed that. And I would look at a lot of film of uh, the potential um, opponent. Not only that, I would also look at the dojo or the gyms. Mm. I would find out who's in charge of that uh, dojo and gym and their philosophy. So I track them down. Okay, so uh, in, in, in a very crass way, I would simply say all shit rolls downhill because the person at the top is going to give their philosophy and the students uh, of that particular dojo or gym mm. are going to follow in suit. Mm. Okay? Yeah. So that's their philosophy, that's their style, and, and, and so forth. Um, and, and so that all, that all pertains to business. In business, I would essentially do the same thing again, as I said earlier, you know, find out who our, our target audience is and, and, and the demographic and psychographics. And we would construct a look, construct a message that would appeal to them. Not necessarily me, because, you know, I'm not the target audience, mm -hmm. but I would tailor that to them. And so whenever we did, a, say, for instance, um, a radio ad or uh, a print ad campaign, it was as if I was sitting on a chair and my target audience is sitting on another chair, too, and we're talking to them. Yeah. Okay? We're not preaching to them. Okay? We want to be relevant, and we don't want to be boring, because who's ever bought... Uh, a product that said, I just recently saw this ad. It was so boring. Oh, I have to have it. I have to have it. So we need to be entertaining yes. in that regard. So it stays memorable. And the same mm -hmm. thing translates to fighting. Yes. Again, mm -hmm. in the competitive sports and so forth. So you look at, say, say football. Oh, my gosh. They do a lot of scouting. They do a lot of research. Mm -hmm. They know... Number 36 has a tendency to move his left foot back as he gets ready to go forward. You know, all these little nuances. And so I would notice the same thing with our uh, opposition in terms of fights. Mm. Uh, I knew when one guy was about ready to throw a spinning rear kick because he didn't know it, but he moved his left foot very slow, very fast, very fast, very fast. And there he goes. Mm -hmm. Here comes a spinning rear. So I would... On my computer, not on a little phone. How can you tell? You can't really tell. <laughs> yes. So I would slow this stuff down to like a, a quarter speed, and I would see these little things. And I would do this at night. My wife would was working at night, too, because we were always constantly working. Mm. And she's really quiet. She likes everything real quiet. I like loud music. Yeah. So I like to think with loud music and, and so forth, which is kind of very similar to going into the... Um, the arenas or, or to the the fight stage, there's a lot of loud music yes. and you know people are screaming at you, oh, kill them, give them one two, dude. You don't know what a one two is. Shut up, and eat more nachos. <laughs> but I would uh, on the computer, I would slow everything down and I would catch these little nuances, a little tilt of the head, and and so forth. And when I did, my poor wife, God bless her, uh, I would scream at the top of my lungs. Says, I sue you, see you, you little <laughs> son of a bitch. I know exactly what you're going to do. And I'd write this stuff down. I'd do a screen capture. Yes. And so I would give my fighters a, a series of screen captures with my notes and the tendencies. With, in Illustrator, I would draw little circles with my comments and so yeah. forth when I give them the strategy. So it's, uh, it's fundamentally the same thing as business. So I translated business into the fight game. Yeah. To give every potential advantage to uh, our fighters. Yes. So they come out successful. And the ultimate goal, at least for me, uh, one is to win. Number two is to come out clean. Okay. Yeah. There's no reason why you should be taking a lot of hits. You're going to be taking hits. That I know. But to come out all banged up, no, there's no reason. Not the way we train. So what age did you have an interest in business? Do you remember what age? Was it during college? Was it after college, before college? It's a good question. Um, I think it was when I was a little kid. Mm. I must have been about six or seven years old. Oh, wow. Okay. So we had a 7-Up and Frosty Root Beer 
distributor about three blocks away from me. And so being a six-year-old, you know, I would, I would just take off running all over the neighborhood. I had no boundaries. I had no chains. If I had a chain or a leash, I would cut the leash. <laughs> My poor mother. I was taken off, including in the middle of the night, yeah, yeah. you know, 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. I was gone. Yeah. So being a person of, I guess, high intensity and curiosity, I would roam the neighborhood. So I would go to these, to the distributor, 7-Up distributor, and in there, close to the big garage doors where the trucks came in, was an open box of these little pads. They would write the receipts and so forth. And so I was mesmerized by the pads because you had, um, I, don't know, I forgot what you call it back in those days, of uh, uh, double, it was double line paper, and you could write a receipt and so forth and make a copy. So I loved that. I loved the idea of being able to draw, write stuff. I couldn't write anything, you know, being six years old. And so I would collect those things, and I would put them in the back. My father built a barbecue uh, out of brick, and I would put them up against the back of the barbecue so nobody can see me, yeah. and I'd pretend I was on the phone cussing somebody out. <laughs> I know, isn't that a trip? <laughs> and who knows, you'd still be doing that today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then when I left home, um, I uh, roomed with this guy named Dave. We, my little brother used to call him Hippie Dave. And this is back in, you know, gosh, 69, 70, and so forth. And I said, Dave, you know, um, we can possibly sell all this psychedelic stuff because posters and buttons were, yeah. were hot. Okay. So I talked this other guy into going into, um, with me, chipping in some money to buy all these fluorescent buttons mm. and stuff and some posters. And so I'd go to the local dances and they had black lights there. And so I'd open up my jacket, just like the jacket that yeah. you brought. Yes. And inside my jacket, I'd have <laughs> these buttons that would glow. And, and I had a couple of posters that would glow. And so I'd stand underneath a fluorescent light. Yeah, yeah. And this is the middle of a dance concert. <laughs> and I would sell these things. <laughs> and I would tell the guy, dude, and call him dude, but your girlfriend really likes these. She goes, oh, Lawrence, this is so cool. And this and, and they're real dorks. You know, they yeah. weren't hippies or anything like that. I said, oh, this would look really good on you, this button here, and check this poster out. And so I was selling stuff on the dance floor. <laughs> and I had to do a really uh, sly, I had to be yeah. sly about it, otherwise yeah. I could get my ass thrown out. <laughs> Escorted by the police, all right, you. <laughs> out I go on the street. So starting it from that age, and it just started to gradually, your curiosity grew within business, like you just kept... Did you keep trying new things when it comes to business as you started to no, age? No, I became enamored with, um, uh, in, in, in college, uh, I became enamored with, uh, with music, mm. okay, and then fine art because I knew I wanted to be a fine artist or at maybe a, even at that time a commercial artist because they made money. Um, but those are the two things that intrigued me, music and, uh, and then fine arts and going to college. Let me back up. Going to college was a challenge unto itself. Because uh, in high school, I went and I thought, okay, I'm going to get out of high school. I'm going to go see a guidance counselor. So I went and saw this guidance counselor that they assigned to me. Asshole. <laughs> um, at the time, I didn't know I was dyslexic. Okay. But I managed to squeak out a 3.9 GPA. You know, it was, it was hard. And, but I wasn't given any college courses. I wasn't given any courses to take at the SAT and so forth. So I went and saw my college counselor, and he looked at me and said, um, Rick, you're not smart enough to go to college. I think you should become a plumber. Maybe if you try really, really hard, you might become an electrician. So being a cholo, I wanted to <laughs> reach across, grab a pen, and stab him in the eye, yeah. as you saw in The Godfather, <laughs> prior, way before Godfather. And so that really crushed me. Yeah. And in my mind, I said, fuck you, I'll show you up. Mm. And so I went to college. And during that period of college, that's, you know, I really focused in on, on, on art and, and, um, and, and then music. I decided early on music really wasn't for me because getting back at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning um, was, not, was not fun. I liked R&B. I liked jazz. Mm. So that had a tendency... Uh, that style of music had a tendency to um, 
uh, invite a very rough crowd. So people were getting shot and stabbed and, and uh, I, I just didn't like that environment, but I love the music. Yes. You know, every now and then I will, I'll pick up my guitar and I'll, I'll start playing something funky. Yeah. And, um, and, it, and it draws me back. But uh, um, a number of the guys that I played with went on to be very successful musicians, primarily studio musicians in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Uh, one guy, uh, John Nelson, um, ended up playing for... Um, Howling Wolf? No. Eddie Muddy, uh, some other uh, pop groups, and then uh, for some blues musicians. The other guy I played for, uh, Troy, started Eli's Mile High Club in Oakland, which was a, a blues uh, uh, and, and, and funk, um, a nightclub that was really popular. And uh, there we go. But it was fun to be around these guys and just watch as they grew. Then we had some musicians that would come down from Los Angeles mm-hmm. via John Nelson. And I asked, why are you guys here? And they said, you're in Fresno. Nothing else to do is except work on our music. Yeah. I went, really? And then uh, I didn't know these guys personally, but they went, we went to the same high school, was the Contis, C-O-N-T-I. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, Bruce Conti ended up playing guitar for Tower of Power, which was real popular in Oakland. And... Um, Victor um, played with them, too, as, uh, as I understood, but he also started the pharmaceutical and got busted for <laughs> a drug enhancement. I thought, yeah, man, this is Fresno. <laughs> we rolled to a different beat, <laughs> literally and figuratively. <laughs> and uh, since, I mean, you going to college, like you said, uh, was a very difficult task, and especially that individual who kind of doubted you, what was it like after you graduated college? Stunning. Stunning. Yeah. I took my degree and I gave it to my mom. She gave it back to me. You know, years later. She says, that way I know you don't lose it now. Yeah. <laughs> mom. <laughs> yeah. It was stunning. Both my gr- brother and I were um, uh, second and third people to ever graduated from, from college. My other cousin, Richard, who lived up here in, in San Jose, we we're in Fresno. Uh, was the first to graduate. And so, uh, interesting story there. When we were both graduating at the same time, uh, there's a big session at, uh, quote-unquote, Selen Arena. Mm. I think it's still there. And across the street on Ventura Avenue was a strip club. So we had an hour and a half to kill, and we had maybe $10 between the both of us. You know, we didn't have any money. Yes. We, literally, we didn't have any money. And um, so I asked Gary, I said, well, want to go across the street and get a beer? So we went across the street to this strip club, and <laughs> we bought these beers. That for us, it was like $4 a piece, yeah. and so we had $10. And so that was really expensive. You know, you should be able to buy a beer for like, you know, a dollar, a dollar yeah. and a quarter back then. Yeah. And uh, so we're drinking our beers. I'm looking at this rough crowd, these guys with their beacons overalls, uh, and there is this young lady dancing in the nude, bending over, showing every orifice to us all. Mm. And the guys are just going, uh-huh, drinking their beers. And Gary and I were like, we have our cap and gowns. Yeah. And uh, underneath our arms, we're like, uh, drinking this beer. <laughs> <laughs> and so we looked at each other. And when we finally left, he goes, well, that was weird. Yeah. <laughs> hey, 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 Rick, do you think we should go back? I don't think we can afford it, Gary. Yeah. <laughs> We only had ten dollars between the both of us, <laughs> <laughs> and even uh, say like after you did graduate college, um, what was that like? Did the idea of uh, Soto Creative, your business, is that where it came right away, or did it gradually become that? It gradually came. Mm. Yeah, my, my, um, I got the first job at a small company, but they were thought they were big. Uh, Duncan Ceramics, which did hobby ceramics, and I got into the art department mm-hmm. by by the grace of God. Because, as I was telling you earlier, people that looked like me with my tint did not have inside jobs. Mm-hmm. You know, an inside job for us would have been working in a warehouse or working in a packing house. <clears throat> and I did field labor all the way till my senior year in college. Out there taking the bus at Chinatown at 5 o'clock in the morning, yeah. going out to chop cotton, uh, pick fruit, and, and, and so forth. So yeah. I was stunned to get uh, an inside job that had air conditioning. 
And that was amazing for me. I thought, man, <laughs> they got a cooler. <laughs> It was really AC, but, you know, back in the day, hey, man, you got a cooler? Yeah. <laughs> so how many places did you work before you started your own thing? I went from Duncan Ceramics to West Type, which was a production house. And from there, I was exposed to other graphic designers working for agencies and working freelance and so forth. And I thought, I can do this. Yeah. I know I can do this. And so while working there, I began to pick up a little bit of freelance. And I was married at the time. <clears throat> and my wife at the time started to say, oh, my God, you're starting to make some money. I have to keep tabs on you. <laughs> she loved to keep tabs on me. So when I finally decided after a couple of years working at West Hype that I was going to go out on my own, and I think I was about 27, 28, my wife great supporters started crying. Mm. We're going to be poor. <laughs> We're going to be poor. <laughs> I thought, okay, that's a nice send off. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I did make some connections and I started to you know, pick up a little business here and there. And I started, of course, very small. And, uh, um, and I was looking at the agencies I was working with. And I'm going, I can do much better work than these guys. Mm. What do they have that I don't have? Ah, they have connections. They have a network. And so I tried in vain to build up a network. But there was a lot of cold calling yeah. that I had to do. They don't know me from Adam. The name SOTO, they thought I was Japanese. <laughs> I had one person say, I'm a six foot. I was... I'm shrinking now. It's probably closer to six one. One woman looked up me. And she goes, "You're awfully tall for Japanese." <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, whatever, lady. Yeah. Uh, so since you did see a, a disadvantage with these other people that you started to pick from, like, oh, I can do this. I can do it better than you did. But was it nerve wracking when you in the beginning stages of starting your business? Oh, till the very end. Yeah. To the very, you know, you go in with a nervous, nervous stomach, a nervous mind, um, and when you retire, you're still that way. You're still that way. Yeah. There's nothing ever solid in business. I met a guy in San Francisco um, who ran a, a, a design firm, and he said something very astute. He said the moment you get a client is the moment you can start ticking the clock off that you're going to lose that client. It could be in six months, it could be in a year, but you're going to lose that client. Yeah. And he was uh, Tom LaPearl, I remember him. And um, he was so spot on with that. He was so spot on. And uh, because our business, our industry is that Let me back up. Our accountant at the time was trying to get us insurance for my business, for my employees and so forth. And so, uh, CPA. And uh, he came back to me after about three or four weeks, and he sat me down in our conference room. He goes, what's wrong with you guys? What's wrong with your business? I go, his name was Dean, D-E-A-N. I asked him, what do you mean by this, Dean? I'm, you know, This is a strange question. What's wrong with us? He goes... Your industry, your business industry is ranked up among the most high-risk organizations, industries. You guys are up there with fishermen in the North Atlantic, and you're up there with po electric power pole workers. Yeah. I went, are you serious? Well, it turns out to be that we had and have the highest rate of cancer, the highest rate of heart attacks among Coal miners, mm -hmm. <laughs> truck drivers, forklift mm -hmm. operators, CPAs. Yeah. And, uh, and that's why he was flabbergasted. He's like, something is wrong with that. I, he's telling me, I double check, I triple check, I quadruple check. This can't be right. Mm -hmm. 
and I started to explain the business to him. He kind of understood the business from the numbers standpoint, but he did not understand our working environment, our competitive environment. And uh, it's really, really stressful. A lot of nervous breaks down. Um, so it's like up there with police, you know, they can't keep a wife or a husband, mm -hmm. and it's really stressful. And we're right up there with them because you just never know when you're going to get fired, okay? Yeah. You just never know when um, the client says, you know, I decided to work with another firm, regardless of how much money you made for them. We, did, we had uh, a client in Siemens over here in Santa Clara. Uh, our first campaign for them, they netted within 45 days, net, not gross, netted $55 million. Yet... When those people that we were working with at Siemens, one was a director, got promoted to vice president, one was a manager, got promoted to directorship, uh, and so forth. When they moved on and they thanked me, oh, God, Rick, your agency did this for us and they got me promoted and so forth. So we have new people moving in. Yeah. So the new people moving in goes, we don't know you. We don't think we like you. And then I, I said, you know, I netted your organization 55. We don't care. We don't care. Interesting. Yeah. We are comfortable with the people that we already know. So you're out, they're in. <clears throat> that's that's the brutality of business, yeah. which kind of correlates to fighting. <laughs> you know? You win one day, you lose the next day. Mm -hmm. You might have done everything right. Yes. Okay? So with that in mind, take a look at the Lomachenko and Devin Haney fight. Lomachenko lit up that guy. Yeah. Lit him up. Devin Haney was in the corner, Dad, he knows everything that I'm doing. He knows it before I'm going to do. He's blah, blah. And yet, they gave him the win, Devin Haney the win. Why? Because Devin Haney's young. He has a longer prospect. Undefeated. Politics and boxing. Yeah. 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 So business is like that too as well. Yeah. You, know, you can do all Everything right. You can make them a boatload of money. Yeah. Mm, we don't like the way you wear your shoes. Uh, I don't wear shoes. I wear flip-flops. See what I'm saying? <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a mercurial crazy. business. Yeah. And so thus the stress. Yeah. So Soto Creative. Yeah. Where did that idea come from? How did um, that all start? We used to be Soto Associates. That's our corporate name, mm -hmm. Soto Associates. So, um... I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think our moniker is that we're creative. You know, we, we got our clients uh, very good ROIs based on our creativity and our strategic thinking. Hands down. Yeah. And so I really wanted to focus on our creative solutions that delivered an ROI. Yes. And uh, so when I would make presentations... Um, I always have the <clears throat> always give the clients three options, and based on the strategy. So I would begin a meeting by reading the strategy that they signed off on, mm. okay, that they signed off on. And I would typically take a stab at the strategy first, based on the meetings that I had with them, and I would say, "This is what I heard you say," okay. And then I would go back. And we would uh, with my marketing person. We would develop and flush out a strategy. And then when I made the presentation, I would go over that strategy before I showed them anything. Mm. And so I would present the work. I said, this is exactly what you asked for. Okay. They go, oh, well, that's nice. And so forth. So this is the same strategy, but I'm pushing the creative. So it's a little bit more unusual, but it's on strategy. Mm. Ooh. Here's the third one. Same strategy, on target, but I'm pushing the creative even further. Mm. Whoa! <laughs> and so I had my wife, Carolyn, with me. You know, she was a great marketing person, still is, from, um, retired from HP. She went with me on, on with a couple of presentations, and... Um, I remember one of these clients with ILOG, which is a, uh, a French company. These uh, three women goes, Rick, do you like doing presentations? I go, hell no, I'm, 
frightened. And Carolyn's doing backup. No, he really does. And, da, da, da. <laughs> and these women are laughing and, and, and so forth. And, yeah. uh, but they always went for the most outrageous because it was the most unusual, but it was on strategy. Okay? Yeah. You can give them a vanilla strategy or, or vanilla creative that's on target, mm-hmm. meets all that they're asking for. And you can do the same thing, but you push it and you push it and you push it. Yes. It, I had a knack for pushing things. Yes. <laughs> push it, baby. Push it hard. <laughs> Oh, yeah. (laughs) So I wanted to talk about your clients and uh, just to name a few. Apple, Bank of America, PG&E, Sun Microsystems, Nortel Networks, Metacode, Marina Center, and many, many more. What strategies did you implement to be able to work with these big companies? Working with bigger companies was a lot easier than working with small companies. Really? Yeah. So since I've retired... Uh, I work with every now and then with some small companies. I uh, work every now and then with some nonprofit organizations. They're not marketing people, okay? So uh, some may be entrepreneurs, and they're used to doing everything themselves. Mm. So when they're looking at our strategy, they're like, well, I really don't understand this, and I try to explain to them. Well, my wife Irma likes likes (laughs) purple. I said, is Irma... The target audience? No, but she likes purple. Yes. Irma has nothing to do with this then. We're talking to about your target audience. So that yes. was always a brutality in regards to trying to bring them along. Whereas working with, say, um, seasoned marketing people, you know, seasoned business people, they're very objective. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that was so much easier because I don't have to reinvent the wheel. They're smart. They get it. Yes. So all the companies that you name, there are relatively little dimwits. Every now and then, one will crop up, and they would all look at him and go, where did he or she come from? <laughs> but it was, uh, it, was, it was a lot easier because yeah. I was given the go sign. I was given decent budgets. Mm. Well, I wasn't given. I asked for them. <laughs> well, you don't ask, you don't get. Yes. <laughs> and you talked a lot about uh, strategy. And since this world is so innovating, how do you stay competitive in a forever world that is constantly innovating? Once again, it kind of you have to look at your target audience. Okay, so everybody's different. So I want to go back to the campaign we did for Siemens, where we netted them fifty-five million dollars. It was to the educational market. It was two target audience there. One was a school superintendent, which is very political. They're elected and so forth. The other one was the tech uh, person within that school system. Different mindset. That person, we found out that the tech person uh, within the school system felt and feels that they have a wealth of technology uh, knowledge. Okay, they all felt that they deserve and should be working in, quote unquote, Silicon Valley. Okay, so their things is from the speeds and the feeds, the the nuts and bolts, the technical aspect, whereas the school superintendent has to be responsible and answers to the public. But what they both had in common with that particular industry, what they both had in common was their compassion and the love for children. Mm -hmm. Ah, Ah, there's our common thread. Our common thread had different messages. Yes. But there was a common thread. So that was like a light bulb that went on. So we developed a campaign that spoke to the school superintendent. And then we developed a separate campaign that spoke to the tech person within the school system and uh, his underlings Mm. or her underlings. And so... That worked out really well. When we presented the campaign to Siemens, they said, we spoke to several agencies and they just sort of rubber stamped something out there. Here, you split everything up knowing full well what our audience is. Mm -hmm. And so the client helped too. Yeah, The client helped. They had to give us, they didn't know what they were doing this. They were giving us clues. And so my marketing people and I, we, we went out hunting. Okay, what is the differentiator? Okay, and so we developed that campaign. Yeah, 
And we were talking a lot off air about the, the stressors when it comes to business, how there's always constant problem solving. Oh, yeah. And in business, there's a lot of gains. There's a lot of wins. But just like how we were talking, it's, it gets kind of bloody. It gets kind of hard. Oh, yeah. In your experience, uh, what are some stories that you remember of dealing with really big setbacks and how did you bounce back? Those setbacks are losing clients. Those setbacks were heartbreaking when you made them a lot of money or you got them an, uh, a high ROI. So, I mean, you can make them money or you can give them a high R ROI in regards to visibility, mm. okay? They were in the dungeons. Now they're at the top in terms of visibility. Now their clients, their audience knows who they are and what they stand for and their products. So losing those type of clients was, was always heartbreaking, you know, because you develop a relationship with them. And uh, I would used to describe it as uh, going cross country with somebody in a car. Mm. You know, you start off, you don't know each other. By the end of that cross country trip, you, it got, you reach your destination and uh, you become good friends and, and, and so forth. And, you know, you know each other's quirks and, you know, oh, She's got to pee now, or <laughs> oh, it's about time for Charles to get another double whopper. <laughs> so you know these things, you know. Yes. And yeah. uh, and and that's kind of like a little traveling trip. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. But those heartbreaking things is always losing a, a good client. Yeah. When you enjoyed the people, you enjoyed the work, and you made them money. Yeah. You made them smile. Yeah. How did you make those adjustments to bounce back? Because usually you that just would, keep on going. Yeah, you keep on going. You know, like you know, dust yourself off and you keep uh, and get up and you keep on going. Because you have you know, at least we had other clients. We never just had one client. Yeah, you know, there's multiple clients, so there's always other issues and and, and so forth. So you keep on going. Yeah. And sometimes those clients that are no longer, as I mentioned earlier, with the Siemens are no longer the organizations can refer you to somebody else because there's a network out there. Yes, there's always a network. Yeah. Do you ever like pitch yourself a little bit and kind of realize like, man, I've done some pretty great things and put myself in rooms that I would never thought I would be in? You get used to it. <laughs> you get used to it. You know, you're there on a mission. Yeah. You know, I remember I was pitching Wells Fargo at the time. And um, <clears throat> this is awkward. <laughs> I had a meeting on Monday and at AKA we used to have our Friday night fights. Andy, Coach Andy Fong was there, and we would just beat the living snot out of each other. <laughs> and uh, I remember I broke a couple of toes. Shit. And I could hardly walk, but I have this meeting with Wells Fargo on Monday morning, downtown San Francisco. Oh. And I think I was telling Katrina about this. And uh, I had to park at a parking lot that was about... <clears throat> four stories high. I had to walk a block and a half hobbling all the way. But I was relentless in sending them stuff. Take a look at me. Take a look at me. Here's what I've done. Here's what we've done. Here's the returns. Dun, 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 dun. Finally, the head of the, the marketing group said to this guy, I remember him now, Tony Vecchio, very cool guy, um, get this guy Soto in here. I mean, he's just, he's just, Relentless. Yes. He will not stop. And so I didn't stop. But I hobbled in. And Tony's looking at me and I'm hobbling in. He goes, yeah. What happened, Rick? And I said, Oh, I just had an accident and broke a couple of toes. I didn't want to I didn't dare tell these people, you know, I'm a fighter. <laughs> And so I had a, a portfolio and I had a box. Yeah. And in that box, I asked him, how many people are going to be there? Six. Okay, fine. I had a box in our office in it was downtown San Jose, and below us was Gordon Biersch Brewery. And so we would take the freight elevator, get some beers, bring them back up. And after a while, we have a, a collection of Gordon Beer Steins. <laughs> so I had one of the girls in the office wash out our Steins. I put them in a box. Yeah. And so I brought my portfolio <laughs> and a box of Steins because you need for them to remember you. You need yeah. for them to smile. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I passed out the Steins and I said, after we do business, we can probably get these Steins filled up. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, 
Oh, this guy's a character. <laughs> and I showed them our portfolio, and they're going, oh, oh. <laughs> they thought, well, this guy from San Jose, just like they used to think, this guy from Fresno pitching Bay Area clients. Yeah. Oh, my God, he's from Fresno. You even have an airport? <laughs> I had literally had somebody ask me that in San Francisco. Really? Being a smart ass and young, I said, yeah, we do have an airport. We also have mail, too. <laughs> there's a plane that comes by, and there's a big tower with a hook and he hooks our mail bag and he flies away yeah. with it and as he's flying away he drops a mail bag for our receiving mail this person looking at me going <laughs> okay but anyhow back to wells fargo i made the presentation i gave him the steins and and so forth and then uh two or three weeks later we got a project for you yeah crazy right who can be crazier <laughs> <laughs> when the person was saying this Soto guy is very relentless yeah and that's what I kind of realized when I when in reading and interviewing successful people it's one yeah. of their common traits uh what do you think uh other traits that people have that are very successful that they have in common probably detailed management you know details you don't have to know every little thing but you need to know enough to make a wise and smart decision and some of those are lying in the weeds. Yeah. So being able to roll up your sleeves and kind of dig in the weeds, manage the details, and then uh, hiring the very best people you can possibly get, okay? So you can trust them. And there are a number of uh, people that worked with me that I really, really liked because they were so good at what they did. And there was some out of desperation that were just in there. As I was telling you earlier about this one guy, uh, you know, you have to be brutally honest and have to tell him, Don, you're not very good. You're lucky to be here, but I can't find anybody else to fill your place, your, your seat at this point in time. That's pretty brutal. Yeah. That's pretty honest, too. Yeah. But that's the reality of it. Yeah. But um, being relentless, you know, just because you get knocked down does not mean you're knocked down forever. Mm -hmm. You get right back up. Yeah. You go at it again. Yeah. It's like in the fight game. You get knocked down, get your ass right back up. Okay, mm -hmm. what did I do wrong? Okay. And sometimes you only have like a minute to really reevaluate when you get sitting in Sometimes the even a lot less. Yeah. You have seconds. Mm -hmm. As I tell uh, our fighters that <clears throat> this game is a matter of seconds, fractions of seconds, fractions of inches. Mm -hmm. Okay. You ultimately have to make a quick decision, a quick assessment, either of yourself or your opponent. Yeah. You attack your opponent, and you create some range, some space in there. You have a nanosecond to get a quick assessment. Okay. Tito's leaning a little bit to his left. <clears throat> his left leg is a little red and, and bruised. Yeah. Okay, so we need to go back to that again. Yeah. How do we do that? Mm -hmm. So we come up with a strategy yes. for that. Yeah. I shouldn't say we. At that very moment, that very second in time, your fighter needs to know based on experience and our training, how we're going to attack that. Go high, memory. go back low. Yes. And you make them limp. Yes. Ah, so now they're hobbling. They're not too, looking too good. Go up high. Now you take them down. Yeah. You take them down hard. Yeah. Preferably with their elbow, your elbow in their chest. Yeah. And sternum. <laughs> Isn't this brutal? <laughs> And I know he used to look like a normal guy. <laughs> and in your in your experience of business, um, I mean, this is even like for information for myself and <clears throat> aspiring entrepreneurs coming up. Uh, what makes a great business, and why do businesses fail? It, it depends on the personality. I mean, you could be hardly making any money whatsoever, but it's a great business for you because you're doing something that you love. Yeah. Okay. And why do business fail? There's a number of number of reasons. I mean, why did Donald Trump go bankrupt, what, three, four times? I always like to read uh, a balance sheet, you know, but that's mm -hmm. like when it comes to like investing in a company, right? But I also think it's important to study the CEO. To oh, absolutely. See if, to see if they're disciplined or if they're uh, reckless or what's their track record like. Yeah. I kind of like to see that and view that uh, before like say investing in a company or networking with somebody. Um, and I feel like when people see a number, right? They, they start to see the money come in and they're like, I've never seen this money before. And then they kind of get undisciplined. They kind of forget like the value and they just spend recklessly. But isn't it like financial discipline so important? 
when it, especially when it comes to business? Well, this is my take. It depends on the size of the organization. If you have a board of directors, that board of directors is going to hold that CEO accountable. Yeah. Okay. So that those are that's the guiders, the, the people that are guiding mm -hmm. the uh, the mission of that business. So, I mean, you could have a reckless CEO and um, the board of directors. It's their job, their responsibility to manage that CEO and saying, Chuck, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Blah, 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 blah. So, and then sometimes they do fail. Yeah. Sometimes they don't put enough money in research. You know, not enough investment. Yeah. They're only for the here and the now, and not for the now and the future. You have to be always planning for the future. Yeah. At least I think you do. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think some of the long-lasting companies, well, let's just take Google, for, for example. You know, they started off just fundamentally as a search engine, but then they radiated out into different aspects of, of technology. Same thing with Apple. Yeah. Wozniak and, uh, and Steve Jobs, you know, they wanted to make... Uh, a computer. Look at them now. They got TV, cell phones, and and so forth. Sometimes they can be too far-reaching, uh, and the public is not ready for them. For instance, Steve Jobs and the Apple phone. You know, he was there way before them, but he got his start. He was inspired by an, another organization that tried something like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can make it better. Okay, so. And that failed, okay. But the whole company did not fail. They almost failed when they got rid of Steve Jobs. Yeah. And they had a couple of clowns in there. Scully, yeah. among one, who was used to selling, I think, Pepsi-Cola or Coca-Cola. Yes. No, Pepsi-Cola. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he was selling sugar water. Isn't it interesting reading about these, uh, say, titans, like the Bill Gates, the Jeff Bezos, the Elon Musk, the... You know, Mark Zuckerberg, it's it's crazy, right? How all these these ideas just come into fruition and them just putting it out there and they just let's back up. Remove the word just. There's no just. Just devaluates the action. It devaluates the, the prize. It's like telling Picasso, oh, he just painted this thing really fast. No, there was no just there. But back to your question, um, those guys did not do it by themselves. They may have had a vision. You know, like Jeff Bezos had a vision with Amazon. <clears throat> I think initially it was fundamentally selling books. Mm -hmm. And from there, you know, it branch, branches out. But if he just said, no, this is my niche, I'm going to keep on selling books as Amazon, you know, it's what we talked about earlier. You need to keep on thinking planning for the future, yeah. investing in more research. Yeah. And that research could be technical research, that research could be a data research, um, demographics, yeah. psychographics, all those parts all play into each other. Yeah. That's business, mm -hmm. okay, if you want to be successful. So even if you're running a, say, a nursery, garden nursery, Okay, you start off selling these plants here, but what about cactuses? Mm. Okay, what about something else? What about if we deliver to funeral homes? <laughs> no. <laughs> Let the people who buy them get yeah. them delivered. But, <clears throat> you know, you know, see where I'm going. Yes, yes. You got to think above and beyond. Just because you are just doing something within that particular niche does not necessarily say this is where I need to be if that's not your mindset. Yeah. If your mindset is like, this is where we started, this is what I think we can be. Also, you said before, the names that I mentioned, and then you added, they didn't do it alone. No. And it's also bringing in the right team and the right people around oh, yeah. your group. Uh, and it's funny, even funny too, when I first came into the group, there's, there's principles that you've asked, say Katrina, you asked John, you asked Chris, you asked Doe, and you asked them, is it okay if Daniel joins this group? It's almost like asking them, does he have the principles? Does he have the work ethic? Does he have the, the open-mindedness to be able to enter this room? So what are core principles? They told you that? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the idea that I got. Because <clears throat> just like how you correlate uh, fighting to business, it's yeah. almost like bringing in the right people for the right group. Because say if I were to come into the group and I was just deterring the group, yeah. that's, that's a bad business transaction. 
It's not going to work in the long term. Yeah. So you were asking the guy, since they were with me more in the room, is he going to be good for us? Yeah. So it's almost like even with business too. What are the principles that you look for when bringing in the right people? One, talent. Two, their egos in check. In my offices, we used to just crack on each other. And I encouraged that, you know? I encouraged that. I mean, one time I left the office, I had a meeting, and I came back, and the front sign that said associates, and then sometimes Soto. <laughs> as soon as I walked in, everybody started laughing. But did I get upset with that? No, yeah. heck no. Yes. You know. Playful, like, playful. Yeah. 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 So, uh, you know, our, my ego's in check. I, I wanted to have, I wanted to be very approachable. Yes. But they knew darn well that I expected the very highest quality uh, from them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I wanted to be approachable, which is kind of like a, a weird dynamic because like, oh my God, Rick is going to. <laughs> but then you know they can tease me you know i didn't care i, yeah. I encouraged it <laughs> and i feel like we did that in the room too we were there was there was discipline there was the work ethic there was play yeah it was like a variety of everything and it yeah. and we were always learning it was always critical it was always challenging but it was also playful like that you have to enjoy your work yeah. you really do if you enjoy your work you're gonna do better yeah and there's not criticism. There is critiques. There's criticism. But the critique is designed to help you or help that individual, yeah. be it in, in, in my agency or in, uh, with, with the fighters, so we can learn and we can build from that. And so it wasn't not necessarily just me doing the critique. I would ask everybody else, yes. okay, what did you see? What did you see that I didn't see? What do you think? Be honest. Because um, that particular person needs to be honest. And if you recall, there's a number of times when I would stop uh, a, a quick little sparring session that we would have. And I would say, you're not helping that person by doing these little light punches. Yes. You have to come in faster. You have to come in harder. You have to try to make it real. That way, that particular person, that fighter, is going to learn from that. And... If there's something that I see that is positive or negative, I stopped it. I said, okay, what just happened here? What do we need to do? What do we need to do as the attacker? What do we need to do as a defender? What did you see? What did you feel? All those things. And so it was more constructive. So we would have a positive outcome come fight night, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. And knowing full well that uh, as fighters, you guys are amped up, you know? And I want you to be amped up. I'm amped up, yes. you know? Because at that point in time, you guys are thinking about the fight and I'm thinking about the fight, yeah. but I'm also thinking, did I give them the right information? Did I give them the right training? Do they have enough skill sets to accomplish what we need to accomplish to finish the, the ultimate goal, which is a win? Yes. And so I put a lot of pressure on myself. Yeah. And uh, sitting in the corner, a lot of times the fans see more than I can see because I'm down so low, I'm like this. I try to get up and you get the officials saying, get your ass down. Yeah. <laughs> I'll kick your ass afterwards, but, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so we try to, uh, I try to call out these little codes that we, that we established and, and, and so forth. Like, for instance, going north. Now go south. Go yeah. south. Pop back north. Two. Yeah. Two seconds. Move. Yeah. You know, change an angle. What were some of the biggest, uh, if you remember, critiques that you would always give me? <laughs> <laughs> Shit, where's my book? <laughs> <laughs> Hang on a second. Oh, shit. That's... A lot. <laughs> Mr. Soto, what have you done? Are you writing a book about me? <laughs> Let's see here. Wait, have I seen these? Yeah, you should have. <laughs> 
Okay. Daniel Gonzalez, here we go. This is all you, Daniel. All right, make sure you say it in the mic. <laughs> this is all you, Daniel. Some of the biggest critiques, what to work on, fundamentals. <laughs> <laughs> Does that sound familiar? Very. <laughs> okay. You're still looping, by so you're shortening your range by inches, <laughs> inches that could rock or KO your opponent. Two, more footwork, in and out, pivots, pulls, and uh, on the move. Three, more groundwork, yet more again. Four, revisit what we began working on, fundamentals, <laughs> <laughs> but with, with now with the twist. Number five, your vision. To identify the ever-evolving situation patterns and opponents re resolve. Six, your ears. Listen. <laughs> Five, your confidence. <laughs> when you when I first came into your door, <laughs> so I mean I I have this for for everybody. Yeah. I mean it, it goes on and on. It's yeah. like I take this serious. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I I really do, and. Uh, I want you guys to take this series too, as well. When you, when I first came through your door, first meeting that we had, yeah, uh, what was your thought process before we started working together? Who's this guy? <laughs> Who is this guy? <laughs> Why is he here? Because I remember um, talking to Anthony. We left uh, Relentless Boxing, and um, somehow your name came up. He brought it up. This is probably the prelude of him giving you my number, mm. Anthony. <laughs> um, and he brought your name up, and I said, you know, I get the feeling that Daniel is like a ship without a rudder. He's like trying this because he left AKA, yeah. he went into boxing, you're back, and, and so forth. And, um, and like a week later or two weeks later, you called me. But if you recall, when I was, in short, interviewing you, and I talked to the guys, uh, the the rest of the guys, and I said, do you think he'd be a good fit? Because I wasn't quite sure. Because I didn't want to in, in, introduce poison. Yeah. <clears throat> because poison will spread. And they all said, oh, yeah, he's cool. I said, okay, <laughs> well, he's cool. And uh, then I asked you to come back over here, and I was holding mitts for you. I remember <laughs> this very clearly. You're doing this, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> uh, we stopped and I, and I looked at you and I smiled and you smiled and I said, Daniel, what do you think? He goes, I think that was pretty good. What do you think, Rick? I said, that was horrible. <laughs> Your face went, oh. yes. <laughs> but I told you why it was horrible. Yes. What I saw, what I should have seen, but what I did not see. Mm -hmm. Okay. If that makes any sense. No, it does. Yeah. You know, because <laughs> you started to put that in me every single day, and there was a lot of things that I thought I was good at, and then realizing, watching footage, say of sparring or watching uh, the feel of the mitts, I'm like, you know what? I feel like my hips are not where they're supposed to be. I feel my head not there's it's standing still where it should be out of line. There were things that I started to notice that I didn't recognize before, and. Watching it is one thing, but I can feel it. Your coaches previously should have said something. Yeah. If they're true coaches, they should have said something. But as I was telling, um, I think, Kristen and, 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 um, and, and Katrina, with them, you're, they're holding mitts for you. And as soon as uh, you're done, you're out of sight, out of mind. They're not thinking about <laughs> communicating with you. Yes. What you need to do, what you need to work on. And so whenever I gave you a, a, a post-mortem, I would consult with other people. I'd say, okay, what are some of the common threads here? And uh, so it wasn't just me, but it was other people too as well. But the on getting back to honesty, you have to, you have to tell your, your, your fighter what they're doing good, what's marginal, what they need to improve on, yeah. what they need to work on. Not necessarily what's bad, yeah. okay? Because that's really negative. But what they need that area to be working on. And why? Yeah. As opposed to giving commandments, dun, 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 dun. But not a rationale of why. This is why I think you need to do this. 
if that makes any sense. Yes. Yeah, it does. And going back to the, the fight game, uh, us, the athletes, the uh-huh. people that you were training, um, we've obviously learned so much from you. Uh, but I feel like there's a crazy thing when it comes to the coach and the guider. I feel like they learn just as much. Oh, yeah. What were some of the big things that you learned from when it comes to teaching? Well, like anything else, or like anybody else, you have to approach the subject with the individual so they can understand and relate to. So my discussion with you may be completely different than, say, with John. Yes. Completely different than with with used to be with Anthony or Liam, you know? And so it's not my, uh, I'm not asking you to, to talk on with my style and so forth. I need to be able to communicate with you at your level. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> for example, Liam Purvis, we worked together uh, for a short period of time before he got injured you know, through kickboxing and then MMA and, and so forth. And um, incredibly high intelligence. Oh, I did not want him to fight at all. But he took off to Thailand. He fought for six months and came back, and we resumed and, and so forth. So talking to him uh, was much different than talking to, say, John or Anthony, okay? Um, not that they have lower intelligence, but it's a different style. So I have to uh, adapt to their style so they can understand what it is that I'm trying to communicate. So, like, for instance, with, with Anthony, I would see something that's not quite working very well. I would stop, and I would tell him a story about what I was reading. And then, so I see these shoulders from here essentially go down and lower and lower and yes. lower. And then we would resume, and he'd pick up on it, mm. Okay. With you, it's, it, was, it was different. It was more of a challenge to your ego. You, you have a, a large ego. So <laughs> several times I've had to say, okay, uh, Daniel, dun, 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 I'm going to work with you. And if- <laughs> How's your ego now? <laughs> but why I did what I did is important. Yes. You know, it's absolutely critical. Yeah. So I'm not just doing it just because I want to be an asshole or I want to say I have a superior intellect or whatever it may be, I need to be able to find a way to communicate. Yeah. So with everybody, it's different. Yes. I don't know if that makes any sense. No, it, it does, it's especially because it, I, I took everything that you gave me, say, outside of life. Uh, and it's crazy how we've only worked with one fight together. And yeah. we definitely, I was definitely around when it comes to other, the other guys fight yeah, camps. Yeah, but you you're and a participant. I, yes, but you and I, we only did one fight camp together yeah. for one fight. And it's kind of crazy in that short period amount of time of how much things that you gave me, because I always, I always tell people I've been, I've been tested physically, but never psychologically. And when I was with you, that's why I was like, man, I needed this. Cause like you said, the ego and I, it never, that never got challenged. Yeah. It was always just like, I'm fast, I'm strong. And everybody telling me that rather than somebody giving me the right critiques, like, no, you're not fast. No, you're not that strong. <laughs> you're you're kind of flat-footed all the time. You know what I mean? <laughs> Nobody would tell me those things. And I kind of correlate that to like right now. Every time, say, I get a client, I don't get too high. Why? Just like how we said in the beginning of the conversation, I could lose that client. Yeah. You know? Every time when, say, the profit is gaining a little bit, I don't get too big on it because I know I could lose it all tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. You That's know? true. So I... My ego, it's, I feel like we have to have a little bit of ego, like say Michael Jordan, Tom Brady, all these greats, they had an ego, they used it the right way. Oh yeah, but, absolutely. But I also need to channel it and to make sure, like re- remember and remind myself, I could lose it all tomorrow. Relax, yeah. Daniel, chill. Rick's gonna hit you in the face. <laughs> <laughs> that mean old bastard. <laughs> <laughs> so everything that you gave me, like I said, it, it didn't, I didn't take not one second of it for granted. Not one. And I still implement it to this day. And that's why I always, I say your name out loud everywhere I go. Oh, no. And I, and I, <laughs> Probably and I, in the bathroom. <laughs> and it's crazy, too, because as I was working with you, I always noticed that you didn't ever like compliments. I beg your pardon? Compliments. Like mentor. To me, to me, 
And I know- I never for, complimented you? No, 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 no. You don't like compliments. You don't like- Oh. So like me, right? I have by myself off air, like when I'm with my family and yeah. when I'm with my friends, yeah. I say your name. And I'm like, he's the reason why I am the way I am now. <laughs> and, and every time I would say mentor, say thank you. And it was just so genuine. You're like, all right, son, you have a good one. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was just very like- Calm, cool, collected. I'm like, does he does he understand that he is a mentor to a good handful of people? Do you know that? And is that a lot of pressure? One, no. Two, no. It's no pressure. But <clears throat> the agency got a lot of compliments too. We have accumulated between 140, 150 awards. Yeah. You know, regional, national, international. And they're in a box yeah. in the garage. And I've started throwing some of them away. Mm. You know? Yeah. It's, it's nice to have. It's nice to be recognized. But at the end of the day, it's like, okay, that's just an, another one. Yeah. That's just another one. Yeah. And uh, in terms of compliments uh, from you guys, I appreciate it. I really do. Uh, I don't think twice about it, though. Not from the ego standpoint. It's like, okay, thank you, but let's move forward. Yes. Because there's plenty more work that needs to be done. Yes. Okay? Because I like winning. You like winning. Let's win together. Yeah. Not just the fighter and myself, but us as a group. Yeah. Because we would help each other get to that stage. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So we go all in together. A long time ago, I think I did a banner. Uh, I said, no, no, I think no one, uh, no individual goes through life by themselves. You know, takes a, it's a journey. It takes it a village. A, it, it, it takes is a village. A, yeah, it does take a village. Yeah. yeah, and so it's you can't go. I did this all myself. Yeah. No, I didn't want us to think like that. So, if when you fought and won. The rest of the team won too because they were a participant in your success. Yeah. I have a video uh, that Anthony took and he sent to me uh, from the fight that we worked. And then as I was getting my hand raised, I kept screaming over and over again, I am nothing without my team. I am nothing without my team. Yeah. Because like you said, it takes a village and, and just like business, you can't do it by yourself. Yeah. You and think you can. No. I think in the beginning when you say you don't have things checked, meaning your ego... You feel like, ah, oh, man, like these guys who say, I'm self-made. I did all this all by myself, la, 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 la. It's like, man, that's, that, that mindset doesn't give you longevity. The person that would say that is not recognizing that they had a great banker, a great attorney, yeah. a CPA firm or a CPA. They did not have support, a great support staff. Yes. They did not have a highway to drive on to go visit those clients. Yeah. Those are all support. Oh, very true. Well, Mr. Soto, I will... Uh, are we done? Almost. Oh. <laughs> so my very last question uh, to you. Uh, I feel like all of us, and you lived a long life. Uh, I feel so like all far. of us... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like, we could be gone tomorrow. You never yes, know. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, I feel like it's very important for all of us to walk uh, with purpose and meaning. What is yours? Oh, dear God. My purpose and meaning? Just to be real. Try to be happy. Try to be real. Try to make other people smile. <laughs> you accomplish that. <laughs> that wise ass. <laughs> Mr. Soto, are there any closing statements you'd like to give for the podcast? Uh, no, just be happy. Be successful. No. Work, hard, work hard at it. Yes. Well, Rick, I would, uh, I know with the whole compliment thing, um, I haven't seen you in a while and talking with you and hugging you and just catching up with you. It felt the best because I do miss you when I'm outside and yeah. not near you. And I miss those talks. I miss those emails. I miss those conversations, those meetups, because like I said, I've been tested physically, but never psychologically. And I kind of take every single principle, every lesson that you gave me into my day-to-day -day life. And it's made me uh, a better man completely. And you are definitely a father figure to me. You are a mentor to me. And I will take your name to my grave. And I appreciate everything you've ever done for me. Well, don't take my name to your grave anytime soon, okay? Absolutely. 
you got a long life ahead. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you, Rick, for coming on. I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you all for tuning in to today's episode. If you got a lot of value out of this, please do me a favor and support our channel by liking, commenting, and subscribing. Again, thank you all for the support. I'll see you next time. Stay loving, stay hungry, and stay excellent. <laughs>